thank you for being here. Um, I'll be talking on AI for engineers. So quick check. How many of you are engineers by, by education? Fantastic. All right. Um, you see, uh, so many talks on finance and commerce, um, but we consume so many things, you know, cars, machines, or even, you know, when we start with our newspaper, there's a machine behind, right? So in today's talk, I just thought of, you know, uh, giving you a few use cases and then talk about trends, that what's really happening in, in the engineering world, how AI can help, okay? So the talk is integrating digital twin and AI for smarter engineering decisions. So how many of you know Digital Twin? Few of you, okay. Any of you have implemented Digital Twin? Built one? Fantastic, all right. So um, thank you for being there. Um, you, you could also add. But um, in the interest of larger audience, I'll first you know, build some background foundation. What is a Twin? And then maybe show you a use case of how we can build one. And then we see how really it fits in the AI workflow because the conference is all data scientists, right? Data science conference. So you'd be, um, you know, learning concepts, key techniques, and then application. A bit about myself, I work as an application engineer. Why I'm talking, I get to talk to various different companies. And uh, I feel fortunate that I can also learn from it, right? So whatever we have learned as a company, myself, Going to present those use cases here as well. Okay, so let's build some motivation instead of just getting into what is a digital twin. A quick question to ask why do sometimes well designed engineering systems fail or underperform? Good challenge to have. Then suddenly, without warning, A second look shows the centrifugal force. Well, as an engineer, I cannot watch that again and again. It hurts, right? Um, now, these systems, they are expensive, millions of dollars. Maintenance is expensive. And if there is a failure, which has not been rectified, underlined, which has not been identified, unplanned downtime can cost additional money. At the same time, it's, in many cases, this is uh, hazardous as well. Good mo motivation. So can we solve these problems? And engineering companies have been doing this, carrying out timely maintenance. Now, can AI help? Can we start understanding behavior of these systems and then predict? Yeah? So can solution be a digital twin? Well, not the only solution, but one of the solutions. So what is a digital twin? If you do Google, you'll find various different definitions. So this is what my definition is. A digital twin is up-to-date representation of a real asset in operation, okay? Up-to-date, emphasize, real asset in operation. Yeah, people might call it cyber physical system, digital avatars, cyber objects, all means the same thing. Um, to give you an example, now I have not taken the wind turbine example because this is something which I have and this is from one of our uh, customers as well. So here is uh, an oil extraction unit. Anyone has experience from oil industry? Few of you, perfect, right? Now you'd see, you might have one site like this or multiple sites like these. Now we are trying to understand the definition of digital twin, what is an asset? This is a rig, out of that 20 rigs, this is one rig, which cost more than a million dollars. Repair cost is $100,000. And from their repair logs, they, are, they find out that pumps are most critical part. And if you can rectify, if you can identify problems well in advance, you can save money, make sense? Now, even if I'm talking about this use case, whatever workflow, AI workflow I'm going to show, 
can be applied in uh, other applications. So um, an asset could be a component, a valve, a system, or systems of systems, right? Up to date, that asset must be continuously pushing data to a digital twin, where you might have a condition monitoring system which might be giving you visual indications of what's the fault. In this particular case, it's saying that one of the cylinders has blockage, right? And then, if this is the scenario, if this is the scenario, failure, how long I have before the system fails? So here is a regression model which is giving you remaining useful life. Now, how is this useful? Eventually, everything boils down to business impact, right? We started saying these are expensive systems and maintenance is costly. A site manager might get a flag like this that location, pump number has some problem, not just about the problem, it's giving you more details that what exactly is happening, one of its cylinder is blocked. And with this faulty condition, you have 15 more hours to go ahead and fix. Now with this information, he can manage his inventory better, run what if scenarios, operationalize planning. Correct? Yeah. So um, we have built enough ground on what is a digital twin. We also saw a use case as an, an example. Let's see how to build one, okay? Now again, I'll be taking the same pump because we have been introduced to pump. And we want to solve this problem. We want to find out what's the fault, what needs to be maintained. So fault classification problem. I have some machine data. So I have some data, okay? And I want to develop an algorithm. So this could be predictive maintenance algorithm. So in this world, they call it predictive maintenance, but essentially an AI model. Right? Challenge. Oil and gas guys might, might be able to, or industrial guys. What's the challenge when, you know, when, when we deal with these systems? Or? Absolutely. As these systems are expensive, we carry out timely maintenance. So most of our data is healthy data. Now, if my, I want my algorithm to detect failure, but we are not feeding or we are not teaching algorithm to identify, uh, learn failure, we do not expect it to predict failures. Correct, of course, you know, connection is, is that aspect. So, um, can I just go ahead and break one of the tooth in my pump? I want to have failure data, right? So. To create this failure cases is expensive, time consuming, sometimes it's not possible. So with this setup, let's try to you know, build our, 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 our story from here. So everyone clear on this part? So we want to build a classification model, but our challenge is that we don't have data. If we just start with that, there will be class imbalance. Okay, so we'll be using this approach. And many of you might be aware of this, these things, right? You start with gathering data, then build a model, and then worry about deploying it, okay? And as my friend there said that, no, then we need to also worry, you know, take care of the infrastructure where you, you know, connect the systems, have that streaming engine in place. So now where really digital twin fits in this workflow? And that's the talk about, right? Uh, this morning, if you have attended uh, Virel's talk, he also talked about you know bridging physics-based systems with AI. Extreme, you know, left-hand side. Your left-hand side is a physics-based model where I know what's happening inside the model. As a domain expert, you would know how it functions. Right-hand side, it's more behavior. He gave an example of a ball which is falling. Right? Well, I can very well have. Uh, you know, sensors both at the ceiling and the and the bottom, and I can maybe figure out what's happening. But if I know the physics, I can continuously track the the complete uh, motion. So advantage with physics-based model is that it's transparent. Yeah. But 
not everything can be modeled. Yeah. Whereas, and I'll show that with an example. Whereas your you know, data-driven model, you capture behavior, but as we said that not every parameter can be measured. Idea is that, can we complement these two? Yeah. So here is my, my talk. This is the theme that we're going to bridge AI, data-driven model, and physics-based model to get better decisions. And these are, I mean, I would call this as a twin. My generation of data will happen with physics space, and I'll be building then, you know, data-driven model based on that. So let's get started with the first piece to build a twin, physics-based. Uh, as you said, many of you are engineers, right? When you build a twin, you got to know the physics of the system. I've taken this slide from IIT Bombay Professor Natraj, control systems. So he presented in one of our conference. If this is a gas turbine on left hand side, I will start representing that with various different stages with equations, first principles. Can you find out you know, what's really, or it's difficult to model with first principle out of these five stages? Combustion chambers, it's a little difficult. Now we can complement that with your data driven models, yeah? So anyways, um, he started with first principles, then also use a simulation tool. So you've got to be a domain expert who understand domain, and a tool might just help you to build one. Um, I did not have those equations, that's why I did not show directly you know, for my pump. I, I had a model like this, a multi-domain model, right, which has mechanic, hydraulic, and, and electrical parts as well. So first is building the model having a representation of the physical asset. Is it a twin yet? It's not a twin, it's just a replica, right? That's the second important part, that you have healthy data, you fine tune with the healthy data, and make sure that it's working as a model. So here we see black is the measured data, blue is the simulated data, there is a gap. What do we do? Maybe you optimize, right? Of course, you know, objective function there. Set objective that I want to have my parameters tuned, and now it is tuned. Can I label it a digital twin now? Yes, I mean, you know, now it is behaving as if it's a real system. I could explain this in 30 seconds, but this process is really, you know, it takes a lot of time. For him, it took two years, okay? Now, it totally depends on how much fidelity accuracy you want to have, how much control you want to have, how much in detail you want to go. We started with saying that it could be just a component or complete system. So what is critical needs to be identified, and that you will do it. OK? All right? So now, once it is a, a twin, I can inject failures, as many failures I want to have. Okay, again here, I should know that what kind of failures might occur. Yeah, that is also crucial. Let me show you an example how this works. I'm, I'm going to inject a failure here, and I'm saying that there is a seal leakage fault. Seal leakage on, and with this fault, as it's a pump, I'm, I'm continuously measuring pressure. Okay, so with this fault added, how's my pump behaving? It was initially between those lines. Now it is going beyond or touching those normal zone, right? So I could add one fault interactively. I can see that, or I can have in real world, you might have combinations of faults occurring together. So I can write a nice for loop there that I want to have fault for this range, seal leakage, blockage. Now it's a twin. I don't have to worry. I can have as many simulations as possible, right? So this is what is happening, and then you get synthetic data. OK, all right. So we started with saying that we want to build a, a classification model, but we did not have failure data. We said that can physics-based model help us to build one, and then use that for generating data, synthetic data. Now, this can be added to your healthy operational data. 
Make sense, right? So what I do next, I add whatever sensor data I have with the synthetic data and then this is ready for the next step, okay? All right, so I have here 240 measurements, a sample or we have measurement at every millisecond, so 1200 readings and 240 measurements. Okay, let's move to the next, next part, which is, you know, building a data-driven model with the available data. Pre-processing, most of you know what are the challenges, missing values, outliers, correct? Uh, offsets, those are real problems. I'll not be getting too much into it because I want to focus more on this particular part, which is feature extraction in this, this world. But let me, let me just tell you, you know, our data had two problems, spikes and offset, okay? That sensor was reaching to its maximum value and we validated this with our, our engineer that it's not possible, pressure just going. So there was definitely a problem. So you're playing the detective role, what's really happening with your data. So we concluded that it was a noise. Yeah, that's again a crucial step. And here, even if all my recordings, measurements are 1.2 seconds long, I still see offsets. So these were only two challenges in this particular data. Now, what I've done, um, so we had this data located directly on Hadoop, but I have copied everything in my own hard drive. So what I'm doing, I'm saying, okay, all the data, which is greater than nine, remove that, and also fill missing values. I'm doing a linear interpolation here. Okay, that's how we're dealing with offset. All right, now uh, with that, I have, uh, so-called clean data. It's ready for the next step, which is my favorite, identifying features, okay? Um, I'll be using these terms, feature and condition indicator interchangeably. okay? So what is a condition indicator or a feature which helps you, that unique characteristics which helps you to achieve your goal? If it is a classification, it should be able to distinguish between healthy and unhealthy. If it is a regression problem, your, your feature should have a predictable behavior, correct? So problem with feature extraction is that you got to have various features considered to build a robust algorithm, yeah? Second challenge, you might not know which are really important. So ranking really then comes in picture. So I could extract features from time domain, frequency domain, or time frequency where frequency is varying with respect to time. Now I don't expect, I don't know whether you, you do that, but I don't expect all of us have to have this knowledge. Uh, let's just see the impact of taking one of the features and, and then prove our point whether just one feature helps to identify failures. I'm starting with mean, okay? I have raw pressure data, I'm taking mean. So here as my faults are nicely labeled, I'm gonna give you a quick two seconds to observe this, you know, uh, plot here. Black line, sorry, let me just, so black line here, just helps. Let's just look at blocked inlet. One of the faults, black line here shows healthy data and I'm comparing that with faulty data with severity of fault. Blue is less severe, red is really severe. Now, let's see if I take a mean, so I'm taking a box plot here. Box plots are super useful when you're comparing two distributions, right? So blocked plot and healthy. I can clearly see that I can, I don't need machine learning here. Right? If it is an anomaly detection problem, I could just say, write, write a threshold that if my mean is less than uh, 7.24, it's blocked in late, otherwise it's healthy. I don't need machine learning. But our problem is not that simple. Well, if my goal is to just identify anomaly, this would still work. Healthy, anomalous, but we might not know what is the fault? My point is that just one feature might not help to do that. 
So in this case, we just looked at mean. It could be a good condition indicator to do achieve anomaly detection, but not for everything. What do we do? I, I can look at variance. I can look at kurtosis, skewness. Now I can very well see that for kurtosis, you know, my all blocked inlet faults can be very well segregated. So if I every time get raw data, take kurtosis, I can say that whenever you know I have kurtosis greater than five, there is a blocked inlet problem. So one feature might be helpful for identifying a particular fault. Another feature might be helpful for doing something else. So you need to have combination. Sometime you might need to look at two features together, mean versus variance. And this is able to distinguish even better, if you can see. Yeah. Um, talking about frequency domain, so peaks, peak frequencies. So if you are getting if you are getting data from rotating machines, uh, normally, um, just to give an example, here I have um, a data from um, a machine which has three sources: bearing, motor shaft, and and disc. If I just look into time domain, I just get a combined effect. But if I look into frequency domain, I very well get three get three different peaks with three different frequencies, right? So if I let me just you know have this side by side comparison, and my point here to tell you that sometimes frequency domain can give you additional information to achieve our goal, which is classifying faults. So if I just tell you to look at these two faults, blocked inlet and seal leakage blocked inlet, and I'm, I'm in time domain. They follow similar pattern. It's very difficult just in time domain to figure out you know, which is what. But if I now look into frequency domain for the same faults, at 2000 frequency, here your magnitude is different. And for blocked inlet, it's close to 0 0.015, yeah? Point, time domain, frequency domain might also give additional information. Uh, let me just show you all these two, two three steps, what, what we have done. So extracting features, and then our challenge also was to find out, uh, you know, which are out of these features, which are really important. So what I'm doing here, importing all the um, uh, data. So I'm using here um, app-based workflow. Sorry, I just jumped here. Yeah, this is what I want to tell. So all those features, you know, if you know, fine. If not, all those are directly available there. Time-based, frequency-based. I can just select all, all the features here, and then those get bundled up in, in my feature table, right? So um, when I want to look at, uh, you know, uh, frequency domain, I can, I can take a power spectrum, I can also see that you know, um, for a particular fault, let's say a, one fault might have four peaks, five peaks, another fault might not, might not have that, right? So I can also look at that. I can select what's the frequency band. Now once this is done, the next important part is that understanding which feature or which condition indicator has maximum contribution to your failure, what can help you. So that's where your histograms will, or this kind of representation will help. Now let's just look at, you know, let's say data mean. How to understand this or how to read this? I'll be asking this question, is this a good feature? If it was a good feature, I will see clear, you know, histograms for all the faults, but it's, there's overlap. So then, I, have, I can use other techniques like ranking those features. So here I'm using one-way ANOVA to rank the features. Again, there are various different techniques to rank your um, features. So that's where the ranking really comes in picture, right? So that's more about feature extraction or identifying condition indicators. Now we have extracted enough information which is ready to be given to training. 
machine learning. Yeah. Again, one solution does not really fit all. We need to compare various different models, and then also need to make it very sure what will be the impact in production. In prototype, when you are prototyping it, it might be a good model, but when you are taking it to production, you know, memory footprint performance might be issues. Correct. So um, I like this for a reason that, and many of the times we get this question: How many times? What is good accuracy? So this is an iterative process. That's my highlight here. You start with historical data, pre-process that, apply various different techniques, get a model. Once the model is ready, I take the model and apply on new data and integrate it. Right? As you know, there are various different techniques available. So how how would be doing that? Again, um, MATLAB users might be knowing there are apps available. So in earlier case as well, we use diagnostic feature app. So there are various different apps available. Doing things. Let me just show you classification learner app, which is I used, which is what I used in this particular um, demonstration. So what I'm doing, exporting all those features we created in the last stage directly to classification um, learner app. Now here I can compare, you know, between two predictors or two features. What's the impact? Whether they are able to give you a good representation. I can select here all the models, so that's what is happening, okay? And then the comparison, which was the challenge. So I'm comparing various different models and see what really works the best. So in this case, it's giving you, un, uh, you know, ensemble uh, with uh, boosted trees is giving you maximum uh, accuracy. Again, there are ways I can look at, you know, the performance there. So confusion matrix, ROC curves. Once this is done. I want to take it and move it to production. So code generation is also there. Okay. Um, now this problem, I am not getting into building a regression model, but if you are interested, how we can build a remaining useful life model, I'll be happy to talk about it later on. So today's case is more on classification. Okay. But based on data, there are various different techniques. Um, I'll just show you, you know, what is important and what really happens in the digital twin world. You start building. So here I'm showing a degradation model with a safety threshold. I know that okay, my machine will fail after, or let's say a car, my car engine will fail after one lakh kilometers. So I know that safety threshold. Now what's happening here is that I start with whatever information I have, and then continuously keep updating model coefficients or parameters. That's the key. So you're making, you're, you're tuning your model. The model is learning, and then you're changing the. So here, if you see. You're getting more and more accurate um, estimation of remaining useful life. Yeah, so that's also very interesting. Okay, now just coming back to this this particular part, that once you have built such a system, you know, a digital twin which has physics as well as we have here the AI model bridged together, built together, and this is now once it is tuned, can be directly shipped. Or put into production. Yeah. So, what we have done so far, we started with you know generating data. We mixed that with the sensor data, which was operational healthy data. That was our challenge. That failure data is not available. Correct. We use here physics-based model. Then we got into pre-processing. Only two problems we had: spikes and offset. We dealt with that. Then identifying features. We saw why it's important. You might need to look into time domain, frequency domain, time frequency. We did not see, but links are available. Correct. Once that was there, we compared various different machine learning techniques, classification techniques, models. Now, it is ready for the last part, which is deployment. Okay. And here, key question which needs to be asked is that which algorithm needs to deploy where? How many algorithms we have built here, or how many techniques? Three. Yeah. First, for generating data, the model itself. Second, for feature extraction, and third, the actual machine learning model, classification model. What do you think feature extraction where it should go? Cloud? No. Edge? Yeah. So. So see, I mean, let's let's see, you know, why it's important to understand. Uh, one way to ask this question: 
this is going to be, let me warn you, this is going to be a busy slide. I'll give you five seconds to look at, but very extremely, extremely useful. So I can ask this question, how much time your AI model has to act? This is really the key question. And that's where you see so many technologies. Yeah. So extreme left hand side is where hard real time, you got to have those decisions made directly that time environment, right? So uh, no, normally your autonomous vehicles, aircrafts, you'll have Im uh, algorithms implemented directly on embedded code. Uh, whereas when you're doing life cycle analysis, dealing with huge amounts of data, where extreme right hand side will come in picture where time really is, you know, you have no constraints as such. So in our case, we'll be taking, you know, algorithm, which is feature extraction on the edge. And in digital twin world, it's important that it is all the time streaming, right? You're getting data from all your assets, okay? Let's just see, you know, one by one, so how we're dealing with that. Why it's important, I mean, answer to why it's important to take feature extraction directly on, on the edge. If this is a pump with one sensor, which is, which is, you know, we are taking measurements at every millisecond, I'll be getting 1000 sample, which, will, which is 16 KB. If I do it for entire day, 1.3 GB. If I have three pumps and 20 sensors, we'll be generating 78 GB of data. Now, does it make sense to send all the data unprocessed pay a lot of money on the transmission, you'll be checking bandwidth as well as cost. So what do you do? On the edge itself, clean the data, extract what is useful and send it what is what can be consumed by your machine learning algorithm. Yeah, make sense? So um, how we're doing it? Now here I'm creating a buffer of 1000 samples. It does not make sense to take mean on every single point. So that's what I'm saying, wait for 1000 samples, take a mean, and then I'm, I'm extracting those features here. Okay, so something which is not right. But I wanted to show here, uh, let's just try one more time. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, sure, I, I got your question. I got your question, let me just you know, stop it there. I'll answer that question and then maybe just you know, complete the talk. Uh, so, historical data. Normally what, what, what is the suggested approach is that you first develop prototypes with the historical data. That's exactly what we have done with the historical data. Once it is tuned, once you have got those algorithms, the algorithm is ready to be shipped to work with the new data. Yeah, okay, all right. So um, what I'm doing is that I'm selecting, I want to convert this into C, so that's what is happening. Again, it's an app-based workflow. So this is my C code, we convert it directly from the fourth generation language. Um, similar can be then also, if you want to take it to Android device, you can call this from directly Android Studio, that also is possible. And let's talk about the, the twin part which is physics based and data driven together, take it to cloud. So what we'll be doing is, we'll be packaging that streaming function. So essentially that streaming function has some pre-processing element, continuously update element, and then classification. Everything is just bundled. What I'm doing, taking that function and uh, converting this in a, in a packaged environment. So it's building the binaries. It's now available as a CDF component. Now I'm not getting into details, too much details of it, but essentially this can then be merged or put directly into something called MATLAB production server, a server environment. Okay, here I'm showing MATLAB because you know that's that's the company I represent, but you could put in, you know, so here we're talking about Azure where you have repositories here, then you have a mechanism to talk to enterprise application as well as uh, management endpoints, right? So your CTF will then 
you know get bundled here all right so um, just to talk about personas here how we can build one and what kind of team you might might want to have so domain experts definitely okay who understand your assets systems embedded guys who can talk to edge devices solution architects azure part right and then data scientists who can collaborate who sees the big picture um a data scientist can also be a domain expert very well possible okay but just wanted to give, bring out those subject matter experts any thought of a uh, difference agree yeah all right so quick summary of what what we have seen we started with that as a problem uh we quickly also summarize the generation part uh the last piece also talked about you no know, how do you decide your ai algorithm or how do you decide where to take your ai algorithm and we looked at that chart that how much time you have how much time your ai algorithm has to act okay so um there are other applications of digital twin as well that you no know, you can have so we looked at predictive maintenance as a use case there are people who are building process twins okay that also is possible so mostly your um, oil and gas guys who do down, downstream processing they also have processes reliance maybe you can have business optimization let me just tell you a story of um, energy optimization guys how how they have taken their algorithms and it also relates to all of us so building iq anyone has heard of this company it's a australia based company consultancy company their client could be hotel like this they came to them and said we want to save energy i don't know you might know this 30% of the energy is consumed by hotels large buildings malls and they have ventilation systems acs which are really inefficient because they do not take care of other parameters like what's the weather outside how many people are inside you know i can keep on running ac here even if there is no one right normally this is what happens that someone will come 8 o'clock start the machine or start the hvac system 8 pm turn it off so here that's that's your um, set point as well yeah so what they did what they did they collected you know the other aspects like both business data as well as engineering data what was the energy consumption yesterday or entire last year two years what are the weather patterns how many people normally visit because it will matter if it is a mall your weekday scenario weekend scenario will be different right so all that was considered and they they start building algorithm keeping human comfort also or without sacrificing that part correct so um this was their original system that they had this um uh hvac systems uh and then it was controlled by a supervisory control it was cleaning the data filtering and then putting a set point now what they did they built a predictive optimization algorithm which was looking at data huge data historical data and this was adaptive optimization model which was a multi objective model that was directly running periodically okay on the cloud and uh, then it was also considering other other parameters giving you more accurate results and set point what was the impact now here they don't have any physics based model as such okay it's more data driven but they can go forward and and uh, you know build something for hvac systems okay all right so you can you can learn more about these things there is tata steel story at last cup could they also have implemented um now gartner all of all of you know gartner they see by 2022 two third of the companies who have implemented iot 
will have at least one digital twin implemented. And this might occur maybe in next year or so. So there's a tremendous opportunity, you know, in, in building one. My question to you is what's your digital twin? All right, that's what I had. Um, we have a demo booth outside. I'll be happy to, you know, be here. I'll be there till 10th. Okay, so any further questions as such, um, of course you can ask, we have time, right? Yep. We have five minutes, perfect. So uh, I would say that, you no, know, visit the demo booth. You can, you can learn more about how you can develop and deploy deep learning algorithms, predictive maintenance and digital twin for sure. We also have a workshop on 10th, which talks about addressing deep learning challenges. Okay, that's at 4.30, last day, last session. And then um, if you are a startup, um, also talk. Okay, that's it. Ready for questions? Yes. Okay. So um, when when we build these algorithms, there are two phases. First is the prototype phase, prototype phase, where you build algorithms, look at historical data, and then you want to take it to production. So MATLAB really comes in the you know prototyping phase. MATLAB production server is a mechanism, a so piece of software which can be bundled, put directly on any cloud, okay? So it can very well look at the load, how many requests you're getting. So for example, if it is a Uber taxi prediction app, which you have built, um, right? Now, how many people want to use your, that particular piece of code? So th it, the software automatically balances the loads and then, you know, connects with other presentation layers like Tableau, Spotfire. It, it has been taken care, yeah. So it is, it is built for low latency environment. So many, many uh, financial companies are already using MATLAB production server as well. Yes. Yes, of course. So uh, I mean, with respect benchmark, uh, so RUL or in general machine learning, so definitely we have, um, I'll also give you a, a link where we have done, a third party has done the benchmarks, yeah. Hi, Shitej. Okay. Hi. So I work for DIGO, which is a distillery company, yeah. and we are working something similar to it. Mm -hmm. We get the data from the IoT level, we process it in terms of the digital twin. But the challenge here is in the auto correction of the machines. Yeah. So can we look into that aspect? Because whatever is going to come out from the production is going to be a visualization kind of thing. Like this inlet is an issue or sensor is an issue. Can we send that information back to the IoT and can this system Absolutely, correct? absolutely. So if you, I don't know whether you looked at um, this particular part, but that is also a key. This arrow here, once you have deployed, it's going back to the sensor. Yeah, so yes, that's, that's possible. We'll, we'll talk more about it. And that needs to be done. You know, the, there should be a closed loop. Yeah. Sure, I, I can repeat the question. So are there any pre-built uh, models, physics-based models which are available? Yes, so there are many models which are available. They get shipped with, with the tool. Um, we also give you components. For example, um, a cylinder can be used in a machine, could be used in an engine. So you get cylinder. That is possible. If you know the physics of it, you can connect it. Uh, hi. Yes, hi. Uh, so just out of curiosity. Yes. Uh, well, if we can generate quality data, why yep. can't we emulate the whole engine and generate healthy data also? Uh -huh. Like that gives you power in terms of, you just need to have a physical model or physics model. And then you can emulate what are the failures and it helps better engineer also, even before building something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially, I mean, if I understand your question that, no, can you just do everything with physics based, right? Uh, that's, that's You can generate the data from physics based, correct. healthy and unhealthy and do your modeling over that itself. Like you don't really have to have sensors invested initially. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, I, I would say, you know, essentially we are doing that initially. I mean, that's, that's, that's the important part. So I'll answer that question in, in, in two pieces. First part, not everything can be modeled. 
like combustion chamber. It's it's difficult, so difficult to model that with first principles. So that's the first. Second part, you got to have real world data to make it better and better, right? So it's always be a combination of an AI model and a physics based model complementing each other. Once it is tuned, it becomes a golden reference. You can do n number of things with it. Yes, of course, that's that's an important step there. All right, okay. I'll be available. Thank you very much. Thank you.